us on a daily basis. Turn to the book of Joel, please, in your Bible. I'm going to give you a head start, okay? Because uh, I just put my ribbon in the place so I could find Joel. It took me about three hours this morning before I could find that to put that ribbon in. So I'm going to give you a head start so you can get there. So it's Genesis, Exodus, Joel. All right, don't believe that. Go shooting past Psalms, keep going. You'll see it eventually. It's after Hosea. You say, great, thanks. That's a great help. There we go. Some of you have those, uh, you know, you just have it on your tablet. You just push it. That's cheating. Can't use that in a sword drill, brother. Some of you don't even know what a sword drill is. I hear as many pages turning now as when I started talking. I'm stalling for you. Joel, Joel, we're going to preach today pneumatology, pneumatology. It's like pneumonia. It starts with a P, okay? Pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. Pneuma is the word for spirit, can be translated wind or something, something like influence, but it is the word uh, spirit. Holy Spirit in your Bible. It's also translated ghost, Holy Ghost in your Bible. It's exactly the same Greek word. We'll talk about why in here in a moment. Pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. Of all the persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I personally believe it's the Holy Spirit that is most misrepresented and misunderstood. And I want to tell you, I personally strain more understanding the person, nature, work of the Holy Spirit than any of the other roles of the Godhead. And there just seems to be, uh, especially right now in our world, especially for the last 75 years, there seems to be a, a, a great liberty, I don't mean that in a good way, as well as a broad spectrum of antics of all type attributed to the work of the Holy Spirit. Everything from holy laughter to the Toronto blessing to being slain in the Spirit to holy barking. Yes, there is such thing as holy barking, okay, or it's called holy. It seems that anything that is unusual that people want to do in the name of religion, they attribute to the Holy Spirit. So if it gets like way far out in your church, you call that the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Not necessarily the right way, right? So I'm just saying that there's just a lot of misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit. Let's have a word of prayer. I don't hear any more pages turning. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, please take us to your word, O God. And uh, I pray that you would help us to see you, Holy Spirit, third person of Godhead, great one who intercedes, great one who groans for us in ways that we cannot pray. And uh, Lord, thank you for this incredible work that you do. I pray that people would leave here overwhelmed and encouraged, uh, that since they have put their faith in Christ, that they are indwelt by the Spirit of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray it all. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? So we look at Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse number 28. Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse number 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Look up here. That's just a word for the end days here in this context. You know, after God has done a lot through time and done a lot with Israel, Judah, it'll come to pass afterward in the end days. When you look at prophecy in the Old Testament, you only see the mountaintops. You don't see what's going on in the valley. And between those mountaintops, maybe a thousand years. So when you're reading something, it may go from immediately what's going on in Israel to boom, the next sentence afterward, maybe 3,000 years later, okay? So get that. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, God talking, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. It's talking about the second coming of the Lord when he comes in, in uh, triumph, when he comes to defeat his foes, when he comes to judge. Verse 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, all right, delivered. It is the word in Romans 10. This is the quote. This is where it comes from. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be delivered. 
For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Interesting to me, that verse. They are calling on the Lord because the Lord has called on them. You may be seated. Joel was a contemporary prophet of Elisha during the reign of King Joash, about 800 years before Christ. This is very important because we're talking about the Holy Spirit and when he was really manifested in dwelling men and women. 800 years before Christ, this prophecy is made that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, that is, all flesh who would call on the name of the Lord. And uh, there would be prophecy and miraculous dreams and visions. And the greatest of all these is the promise that he would pour his spirit upon those, and it became very clear, in those, upon those that would call on the name of the Lord Jesus. What a promise. What a promise. Not just, you know, you're allowed to go to heaven, but I am going to indwell you. If you will trust on my son, I will indwell you. I will come inside to live with you. What a promise. At Pentecost then, in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 16, Peter requoted this passage here that we just read, and he said that this passage was fulfilled as the power of the Lord came that day in a mighty rushing wind and upon the disciples of Christ as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to to do miracles. They began to preach in other languages. And so those that were gathered for that festival, that Pentecost festival from other parts of the world who spoke other languages, they heard everyone in his own tongue what they were saying. Those these guys had never learned Arabic and had never learned other languages. They heard in their own language this miracle. And from that amazing day on, this was fulfilled that those who call upon the name of the Lord are filled and indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. What an incredible thing. And I'm going to shake you today on this gray day. Don't worry, the sun will come out tomorrow. Someone sang one time. Don't worry. But I'm going to make the sun come out in your heart in a different way as you are shaken with all the incredible truths about what God has done and not only giving us his son, but also giving us the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful gift and promise of God. Today, we continue our study of these doctrines, the Holy Spirit, pneumatology. Uh, just like the, the first church continued, you know, we, how we got into this uh, by this, this series we're doing, what the world should the church be doing, and we, we came in Acts 2 to, they continued steadfastly in doctrine, the apostles' doctrine. Doctrine, understanding, clear teaching, not just experience, but the doctrines of God was very important. And so we look at, we're maturing through the doctrine today of pneumatology. Folks, as I study the Holy Spirit, and I've been studying him, you know, whatever, since probably I got saved. And so have you, you've seen different phrases, passages, whatever. I was shocked as I, as I really gave myself to this study about how vast the, the Holy Spirit's work is, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's not just something you can stick in. We will not near be exhaustive today. I, I'm, we're only spending one Sunday on this. But there, there are crazy, wonderful, and vast things that the Holy Spirit is doing among his people and really among this world. Just for an FYI, I, think, I feel like that I need to tell you this as far as translation. So just for an FYI, you see sometimes, you ever wondered why uh, our, our translation sometimes says the Holy Spirit and sometimes say the Holy, says the Holy Ghost? Well, I assure you that the Greek word is the same, pneuma or pneuma, pneuma, okay? It is spirit, it is ghost. The reason, and it really, I always wondered why this was so, why the translators chose, and this is the reason why. The translators felt that when they saw the spirit of God, you see how that's possessive, like God is possessing the spirit, or they see the spirit of Christ, that that was talking about something different than the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And uh, this was not right theology, but this is how they felt. This is why they translated. So when you ever see a possessive in the New Testament, when it's saying the Spirit of God, they never say ghost of God. They take that word, they wanted to translate it a different way so that we would see a distinction. And the third person of the Holy, uh, of God, of the Trinity, they called Holy Ghost. But when they were talking about possessive, the spirit of God or the spirit of Christ, they never use the word ghost. 
And that's why they translated this way. I want to assure you with great confidence that he is, in all cases, the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost is the same person. He is the third person of the Trinity. The Spirit of Christ is truly the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit, only one of them, all right? The divinity and person of the Holy Spirit this morning. It's important that we establish what or who the Holy Spirit is right off the bat. What is the wrong word? It's who. The Holy Ghost is not a force. It's not a movement. In in fact, some of you know that my friend Scott Bandy, he will never say the Holy Spirit like an article, like a thing. He always says Holy Spirit. You know, he cuts the the out, and it sounds really weird, but he's right. We never say the Jesus. I guess we say the Father. We don't say the God. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not a movement inside of you. He is not when some prickly feeling goes up your spine. He is a person. Now, truly understanding him and yielding him may make some prickly feeling go up your spine. Don't get me wrong. You know, he uses our emotions and our feelings. But he is a person, not a feeling. He's the third person of God, a person. And this is best seen in Scripture through his independent personality traits of decision. You know, if you're some kind of force or some kind of, yeah, 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 you know, whatever, this smoke kind of idea of the Holy Ghost or whatever, uh, as far as an influence, you wouldn't see him in Scripture making decisions, having feelings, giving guidance. There is a person involved here. Acts 16, verse 6 or 8, and I don't mean person by a man, right? You just understand that they're the three persons of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean it that way. So in Acts 16, we hear this. Now, when they had gone throughout uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So the Holy Spirit is making a decision about these missionaries, about these ambassadors of, of the gospel. He says, you can't go there. Verse seven, after they were come to Mysia, Uh, They uh, essayed to go into Bithynia. They wanted to go to that town, that area. But the Spirit suffered or allowed them not. It's very clear here that this is not some emotional thing uh, as far as the Holy Spirit being an influence or a feeling. He's a person who's making decision about his missionaries. He is a decision maker. The Holy Spirit makes decisions. He directs. He forbids some things. He allows other things. He is a person, not an influence in your life. Ephesians 4.30 says it this way, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So, so, you know, influences don't grieve. People grieve. Persons grieve. And the Holy Spirit, and there's much more said about this, because you're the temple, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He, you can grieve him. Just like you can grieve your friend, or grieve your wife, or grieve your husband. You can grieve him. It's because he's a person. He feels things. He's a person just like the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit also has the attributes of the Godhead. All right? He's not just someone who is sent out of the Godhead. He himself is a person of the Godhead who has all the attributes of the Godhead. He is eternal, Hebrews 9, 14 says. He was part of creation. He was there. All three members of the Godhead was there. Jesus Christ being the one who who actually did creation, as we saw last time, last week, The Holy Spirit was there too. Genesis 1-2 says, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. He was active in creation as well. And here is something. I told told Pastor Pritt that there were things in this study going through the Holy Spirit this time that I had never known before. And here's one of them, all right, as as I looked at Scripture. The miracle of life you know, what is that essence between, you know, you have, you have a, 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 an animal who just a second ago was alive and now the, the, the life is from them, or a person for that matter, that miracle of life, what is it? In the scripture, it is attributed to the power of the Holy Spirit, the miracle of everything living. Track it with me, please. Psalm 104, the first part, 30a says, thou sendest forth thy spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, they are created, And it's talking about all living parts of creation. The Holy Spirit is the difference between something being dead and something being alive. We see that even clearer in Job 34 and verse number 15. And this verse says this, If he, that is God, 
set uh, his heart upon man, that means he considers man or particular man, if he, God, gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, that is, he retracts his spirit, his Holy Spirit, and his breath, then what happens? Verse 15, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto dust. What is it that keeps, you know, we know, we saw that Jesus Christ is the one who makes all things be sustained and consist, but we see here the hand of the Holy Spirit also of what makes things alive, animate. It is the Holy Spirit who has his power or his hand in all living things. If God would retract that at any moment, all men would die, all women would die. Everything would die, and I think this includes all living things. The Spirit gives life to living things. Scripture records that the Holy Spirit has other attributes of the Godhead. He is omnipresent everywhere at one time. Psalm 139, 7 says that you cannot flee from the God Spirit. He is everywhere that you could ever go. Omniscient, 1 Corinthians 2.10 says, the Spirit knows the deep things of man. You say, Pastor, nobody understands me. The Holy Spirit understands you. That's a little scary sometimes because I have some really strange thoughts sometimes. You know, I would never say them out loud. I'd never tell Amy about them. You know, this, the, all these weirdo things that happen. You know, the, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit's like inside of me saying, mm, that's interesting. <laughs> He's inside of you. He knows how weird you are. He really does. Omnipotent. Romans 15, 19 says the Spirit has mighty power. He has the same attributes of the Godhead. He is a person of God, one of the three persons of God. One God who is in three persons. Now, that is the divinity and person of the, of, of the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to really give you some incredible things right now about the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. When God decided to do this thing, create the universe he decided that there would be roles played by each member of the Godhead. You know, you remember that Jesus was his ambassador who provided the door to open to reconcile man to God, to tell us what God was like, whatever. And we, we, we have a really clear handle, I think, on how Jesus Christ sacrificed himself to make our reconciliation he, he was killed so our offenses might be, that we might be justified. But I don't believe that we have a really good handle on the Holy Spirit and his roles. And when God, the Godhead decided to create mankind and knew that he would substitutionally sacrifice his son, there was a role that the Holy Spirit would play towards men. It's a whole new role. It's a whole bunch of roles that he didn't need to have before there was no men, no women. And these are pretty shocking. Over a little year ago, I introduced you to a list, I think on a Wednesday night, of 50 things that the Holy Spirit does. This is very interesting to me because I want to really understand the Holy Spirit. I think you do too. I don't, I don't want to get into the abuses of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to like think I know what the Holy Spirit's like. I really want to see it from Scripture. It's adapted, these, this list of 50 was adapted by, uh, from an author named Frank Vi- Viola. I don't know anything about him, so don't like write back. I know that this list is solid. I know that the scripture, I, I went through many of these, the scripture that is being used to prove each of the points is solid. And it's very profitable for you and I to ignore every book on the Holy Spirit in the Christian bookstore and to turn off our TV on the Inspiration Channel about the Holy Spirit and just see what the scripture says about the Holy Spirit. So that, you know, I don't want any less of the Holy Spirit that, that I can ever have that God says who really, he really is. I don't want to yield my body and my my inner man any less to the Holy Spirit. I want all of the filling that I can get. I want all the baptism. I want all the indwelling. I don't want anything to fall short in what God really has for me of the Holy Spirit. Is that true of you? Okay, so let's really see what the Holy Spirit, his real work. I am really going to read these 50, all right? They should have been in your bulletin. There's a there's a list of them in your bulletin that you can follow along with. should be sticking out in your bulletin. All right, I'm going to go pretty fast. You can see the references with them. I would encourage you to keep the list. The Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit guides us into all truth. The Spirit regenerates us. 
the Spirit glorifies and testifies of Christ. The Spirit reveals Christ to us and in us. The Spirit leads us. The Spirit sanctifies us. The Spirit empowers us. The Spirit fills us. The Spirit prays with us and for us. The Spirit bears witness in us that we are the children of God. The Spirit produces in us fruit or evidence of his work and presence. The Spirit distributes spiritual gifts. The Spirit anoints us for ministry. The Spirit washes and renews us. The Spirit brings unity and oneness to the body. The Spirit is our guarantee and deposit of the future resurrection. The Spirit seals us under the day of redemption. The Spirit uh, sets us free from the law of sin and death. The Spirit will make alive our dead mortal body. The Spirit reveals the deep things of God to us. The Spirit reveals uh, what has been given to us from God. The Spirit dwells in us. The Spirit speaks to, in, and through us. The Spirit is the agent by which the, we are baptized into the body of Christ. The Spirit brings liberty. The Spirit transforms us into the image of Christ. The Spirit cries in our hearts, Abba, Father. The Spirit enables us to wait. The Spirit supplies us with Christ. The Spirit grants everlasting life. The Spirit gives us access to God the Father. The Spirit makes us corporately God's habitation. The, the Spirit reveals the mystery of God to us. The Spirit strengthens our spirits. The Spirit enables us to obey the truth. The Spirit enables us to know that Jesus abides in us. The Spirit confesses that Jesus came in the flesh. The Spirit says, come, Lord Jesus, along with the bride. The Spirit dispenses God lo God's love into our hearts. The, the Spirit bears witness to the truth in our conscience. The Spirit teaches us. The Spirit gives joy. The Spirit enables uh, some to preach the gospel. The Spirit moves us. The Spirit knows the things of God. The Spirit casts out demons. The Spirit brings things to our remembrance. The Spirit comforts us. The Spirit makes some overseers in the church and sends out some out to the work of missions. When I saw these 50 things, and when you just dwell and think through these 50 things, you know, I'm used to seeing a piece of paper in an ordination council or something about the works of the Holy Spirit, and, and you're seeing this small, in-a-box kind of thing about the Holy Spirit of God. But I want to tell you folks, when you really consider all that the Holy Spirit does, what immediately sticks out to me is the humongous, full, engaged, powerful, ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in this world and in my life. The Holy Spirit is not barely working in you. He is working in you mightily, even though you may not even realize it. It is like all this spiritual stuff God says is going on among in the church and among believers and in my life that has to do with the Holy Spirit and we don't often appreciate it or value it or maybe even recognize it. So what I did is I took this list with the scripture and I, I, wanted, I wanted to put it in an outline in a way that you would remember it and the way that you would appreciate it and the way that you would remember it a year from now. And so I categorized these. I did it in the dry erase board, on a dry erase board in the fellowship hall. I took this paper and I just took a pen and I started categorizing all of these things, just one after the other, the scripture and the list and, and other verses, whatever. And so I put them all into really four points that they could go under, that they reflect all these verses to help you to remember it this way. All right, here it is. Good toads can hop. All right, good toads can hop. Brother, there's something wrong with a toad that can't hop. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Good toads can hop. Okay, so it's G-T-C-H, right? G-T-C-H. Did, did not come up with this in my head, well, the toad part, but did not come up with the categories. Took the list of scripture of what the Holy Spirit, we're told, is doing, put them in categories naturally that, of, of things that he does. Number one, G, good toads. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth. He guides us in truth. Many of the verses about the Holy Spirit describe him leading, teaching, guiding your thoughts and life into the truths of God. He is changing your thoughts. He is unshaping and reshaping your 
thoughts, of things that you thought were right, and things that you thought that were truth, and thought, things of ways that you had already painted the picture of God. He is repainting it to the truth. He is constantly your tutor teaching you about God. And I am convinced interjecting in a hundred ways in your week to teach you about God. We are constantly growing in truths by his work in us. And he does this all the while, as we have seen in the book of Galatians, all the while he does this while fighting against our flesh. While desiring or lusting against our flesh, fighting down your flesh, he is teaching you and growing you in God. He is guiding you into the truth. This, this guiding into the truth of the Holy Spirit, it first begins when you're saved. It first begins at salvation. Listen to Jesus' words in John 3, this famous passage. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, Nicodemus. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, or thee, ye must be born again. Now listen to what he says in verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, I mean where it's going. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whither it goeth. I can tell you that this is definitely true of the weather people in Delaware. They have no, you know, there it is, it's blowing, I can hear it, I don't know where it came from, don't know where it's going to go now. Now look at the coal, after the colon, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So is everyone that is born a second time, and that time into the family of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who births you into the family of God. He is the divine obstetrician. He does the salvation work in another passage, Titus 3, of wa the washing of regeneration, making you have born into a new family, and the renewing, making you new, of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. But notice in this John 3 passage here that Jesus describes the this, this salvation work of the Holy Spirit like the wind that is impossible to track. So is the sovereign salvation of God's drawing when a man or a woman to put their faith in Christ. Why is it that some who are given the gospel hear it, value it, and want to be saved? And then others, they don't want anything to do with the gospel. What is that? It is the blowing, the wind of the Holy Spirit. And this is why we are called. We never can understand that. We never can determine that. And so we are called to preach to all the world that Jesus saves. Our message is whosoever will may come. That is our message to bring. We do not know where the Spirit will blow. We do not know where the Father will draw. And so we evangelize everyone the way the Word of God says. You leave that blowing and drawing business to the Lord God. You be an evangelist of the gospel. You be a speaker of the gospel. Just tell them. Let the Spirit blow in if he wants. You just tell them. On uh, Friday, it was our, I don't know if it's a privilege ever to do a funeral. You know what I'm saying. But uh, Bessie and Mary's older sister, Kat, uh, passed away in Jersey. And so we drove across the river and we did the, the funeral there and got to meet their family and all of that. Preached a very simple gospel message during the funeral. And some people in the room were very, you know, body language, you know? I'm glad they didn't have like tomatoes around them. You know, some were just very, they, w they couldn't even bring themselves to listen to the gospel. There's something, anger between them and God. There's some resistance, whatever. Then others around the room leaned in and gave just a simple, simple, clear gospel message, and at the end invited those who would like to call in the name of the Lord to realize that they are sinful before God. But Jesus Christ took the punishment for all their sin, and if they would believe that that is the only way of salvation, not of good works, but because we're broken and, and sinful people, but Jesus reached out to us in grace and mercy to give us something we didn't deserve. If they want that, call on Jesus to save them in their sinful condition. And several did. Called on the name of the Lord to save them in fulfillment of the Joel passage. And were 
immediately indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. The first introduction to the Holy Spirit guiding you into truth was the day that he saved you and made you born again. You saw that gospel message the way that the vast majority do not. Why did it make, why did you have ears to hear? Why did you have eyes to see? Because the spirit of the living God opened your eyes and your ears to hear. Thank you, Lord. That is the appropriate thing. Amen. This regeneration of the Holy Spirit, where he begins to guide us into truth, is also called in the scripture the baptism, the immersion of the Holy Spirit. Not talking about baptism. There's a baptistry if you're visiting underneath here. Not talking about water baptism, okay? This is salvation, the immersion into the body of Christ. Now, charismatics would teach that spirit baptism is a separate, a second experience to salvation. They would not agree that that the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens the moment that you receive Christ. But let's hear the word of the Lord on that, okay? What does God say about it? Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Look Look at it overhead. Here we go, Pete. Got it? All right. For by one Spirit... We were all baptized into one body. Any of you know that your scripture, you absolutely know that that's talking about salvation. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. When the Holy Spirit immersed you into the body of Christ, his body, those the saved, that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are told here, this is salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the birthing into the body of Christ. But this guiding of the Holy Spirit, gee, good toads, uh, has other manifestations as well. Uh, The Holy Spirit guided, guides believers into truth in different ways. You often, often see the Spirit in Acts guiding the work of the church and the greater kingdom of God by directing Christians and apostles and pastors. We already saw that in verses. He decides things. He, he moves things. He changes things. He leads them. He guides them into the will of God, and he hasn't stopped. Do you know the Holy Spirit of God makes decisions about Lighthouse Baptist Church and about you, the members of it, and other churches also? The Holy Spirit is making decisions. He is guiding. He guides us into the will of God. He guides your life into the will of God. In Acts, he set apart the Gentiles to hear the gospel. There are verses that all of a sudden, you know, it was given to the Jews, the gospel was given to the Jews, and then the Holy Spirit set the Gentiles apart to hear the gospel. A decision made. He is guiding the great kingdom of God to, to its great conclusion, its great fruition. He chooses ministers to go somewhere to minister. I believe the Lord took Amy and I to Pratt, West Virginia, back in the day in our first ministry. I believe that he made a decision, a change, and he took us to Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. And then he made a decision change, and he brought us to Newark, Delaware. Well, first to Newcastle. All right. He makes decisions about these things. He moves. I don't want to get too much into Revelation, but he moves his, his, the lights, his candlestick in his church. He, he makes decisions like that. He stops people from doing certain things in ministry. He prohibits them, and others he pushes forward. That's you. I'm not just talking about ministers. I'm talking about when there's an opportunity to do some ministry for Jesus Christ and your heart is saying, I should do it, I should do it, I should do it. Why do you think that's so? The Spirit is encouraging you. He's pushing you to do it. Because His Word is now complete, the Holy Spirit guiding you will work right together with His written Word. Spirit of God will never tell you anything that's contrary to his word. He will lead you through the word. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, this. If you neglect the word of God, his word, the Holy Spirit has written that word. He's inspired it. He illuminates it. He's preserved it. Don't, do, you, do not expect him to guide you. If you won't read his book, if you won't read his instructions, if you won't read how he's trying to talk to you or along with how he's trying to guide you. Yeah, the name for that, when you are reading scripture and, and, and hearing the preaching and, 
and you understand something you never understood before, and your heart is touched in a way that's never heard, been touched before by a scripture, by a passage. The name for that is called illumination. Let's all say it out loud. Here we go. Illumination. It's not what you do to your house at Christmas time. Okay, this is a biblical principle. One more time, illumination. It's fun to say. The Spirit exposes or illuminates or lights up truths in, in God's word to your own heart. You know what it's like, those of you who have been saved for any length of time, you're reading through a passage you've read before, but then all of a sudden, there's something there you never saw before. You know what that's called? It's the growth of, it is the progression, it is you changing, it's the illumination of the word of God by the Holy Spirit. When you're reading God's word and meditating on the things of God, you need to understand you're not alone in your thinking. I wanna talk to some of you. You don't read your Bible anymore because you can't understand it. Shh. Let me let you in on a secret. Don't let the deacons know. There's a lot of times where I'll read a scripture, a passage, and I don't understand what it means. Don't quit reading. Don't quit, meditate on the word daily because you struggle. You know why? There's great hope. There's someone else reading the passage with you. You know what's great about this? He's the author of the book, the Holy Spirit, illuminating your mind. And it may take time. Frankly, there are chapters sometimes where I read like four or five days in a row try to get it, to try to understand it, to try to have the Holy Spirit explain some about it. And I often don't understand all of it or even half of it. It's okay. The Spirit of God is committed to grow you long-term, to illuminate his word long-term. 1 Corinthians 2 explains illumination this way. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know, there it is, the things that are freely given to us, of God. How do we know that? Because the Holy Spirit is inside of us explaining. He's, he's guiding us into this truth. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. It's not that you figure it out by your, because you're a brainiac what some verse means. It's, it's by which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. As I compare the scripture, as the Holy Spirit tells me about this, oh yeah, well that's, far, that's explained farther in another passage, and you look at that passage, and it looks like that passage. What is happening in me is illumination. The Spirit of God is growing me. He's teaching me more and more more about God. You say, Pastor, I don't think I'm growing or understanding fast enough. Join the crowd. It's all right. We try, 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 and then the Lord will come in there, and we'll be like him for we'll see him as he is. On this side, we engage ourselves and submit to illumination. I do believe the Holy Spirit guides you personally in specific de decisions of daily life. There is a point, you know, James 1 talks about asking for the wisdom of God and believing he's given it to you. As you commit yourself to preaching and meditation on the word and listening to the word of God, the Holy Spirit also leads you in some of those specific decisions you gotta make about whether you should, you know, go to, you know, move your family, whether you should um, take a job, whether you should do this, whether you should refinance your house, these kind of things. Definitely, starting with, with the word of God, definitely getting the conversation of, of uh, in, in the multitude of cal ca counselors, not calendars, and the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Definitely, but I do believe the, the Holy Spirit also leads you. I'm not talking about extra revelation. Please don't think I'm talking about anything extra to the word of God. I'm talking about it's the Spirit along with the Bible guiding the Christian through burdens and convictions and decisions and determining his will in a particular decision or a particular direction. The Holy Spirit guides us. You're not alone. Does that encourage anybody in the house? You ever freak out that you're going to make the wrong decision in life? I had a teenager once. We were headed to a Christian school to visit a Christian school, Christian college, and she, she started, uh, this is Julie Dugan, Dwight, she started freaking out because she was afraid 
if she went to the wrong college out of the will of God, she wouldn't re- meet the right man and she wouldn't get married to the right man and they wouldn't have the right career and they wouldn't go to the right place. <laughs> Stop freaking out. You got a Holy Spirit. And if you want to do his will, he says, no, my will. He will lead you. You won't accidentally fall out of the will of, of God if you're submitting the Holy Spirit in your life. And that's a great consolation to me because if I could fall out, I would fall out. Number two, good toads, T. Holy Spirit teaches us about Jesus. Teaches us about Jesus. I should take the emphasis. T, teach us. He is pointing us to Jesus. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Now here it is. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Two chapters later, he said this in John 16. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Hello, hello, hello. Charismatic chaos. Always just focusing on the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus is somewhere subservient somewhere else. If you have a situation like that, it's not according to doctrine. It's not according to... The Holy Spirit would not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He, verse 14, he, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me, Jesus Christ said. For he shall receive of mine, or my things, and shall show it unto you. This is a really weird thing in the Godhead, the roles of the Godhead, the hierarchy. I don't understand it. I just preach it because it's true. The Holy Spirit doesn't focus on himself. He, point, he always points to Jesus. And you remember, when Jesus was here in his earthly ministry, he was always pointing not to himself, but pointing to the Father. It gets even more interesting when you understand, we realize that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ in Romans 8, 9. And when Jesus is promising to send uh, to the disciples a comforter in John 14, 18, he says, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So what are you saying? When the Holy Spirit indwells us at the moment that we are born again, it is also, or maybe I can leave out the word also, it is Christ indwelling us. I think these things are all in the great trinity of God, the great amazing fact that they are three in one. Please don't ask me to explain that. Good toads can hop. Good toads can hop. The Holy Spirit changes us, changes us. Aren't you glad that you're not the same person that you were on the day that Jesus saved you? What would you be like, all right? The Holy Spirit changes us. Many of the verses about the Holy Spirit deal with sanctifying us, purifying us, changing us. It is a major goal that he doesn't leave you. Once he saves you, he doesn't leave you the person that you were before. Over time, he grows the fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, the rest of the fruit of spirit. He brings us, for instance, into unity with other believers. He's changing us. He's changing you. Instead of pushing away maybe from other Christians, other believers, like might be natural in your flesh or even natural in your flesh of being maybe a hyper-separatist who doesn't think there's any way but your way, Spirit of God's always drawing you together. Holy Spirit desires that his believers that his body the church would be one he illuminates our minds as i've said before he gives us gifts to minister he's changing us he hands out these gifts for us to minister in our christian life we've seen that in the last several months this is all about change the holy spirit doesn't just birth you into the family god he is your life coach that is growing you guiding you growing you and changing you do you want to be changed church Do you want to be changed? I think one of the most spiritual prayers that you can you can utter up to God is, "Lord, I don't. I'm not content staying the way that I am. I want to be like Jesus. Change me, Holy Spirit." I think that's one of the most godly and most humble prayers that you can pray. Change me. I don't want to be the same. I want to be like you. H hop. So these good toads they can hop. All right, hop. The Holy Spirit, H, helps us. He helps us. In John 14, verse 16, the scripture says, and I will pray the Father, Jesus talking, and he will give you another comforter. Let's pause right here. There's different words for another 
It can be other, another of the same kind, another of a different kind. This word means another of the same kind. He says, I'm going to leave you, but who I'm going to send you, he's going to be another comforter. I was the first comforter. I was the first one that came alongside of you, the paraclete that came alongside of your life, Jesus says to his disciples. I'm going to send you another one of the same kind, and he is going to come alongside of you, that he may abide in you, with you, excuse me, forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Oh, great trinity. Great stuff. Wonderful stuff. Jesus was going to leave them bodily, but he was going to come back. He is the spirit of Christ to indwell them. Jesus, is call, Jesus called the Holy Spirit the paraclete, the comforter which is, it has a lot of implications, but really someone who comes alongside. And it can be to aid and to help. But all, also the view of a, a defense attorney, someone like uh, legally who comes alongside to help you. Different verses on uh, the helping work of the Holy Spirit say the Spirit empowers you for things that you cannot do. You know, there's things in your life right now you cannot do, yet the Holy Spirit can help you do things that you've been asked to do, maybe spiritual things, maybe missions for the Lord, things that you cannot do alone. I agree that you cannot do alone. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to empower you. The, the verses on helping say that he fills us. You know, the idea of us giving ourselves completely to him and him doing all the leading. He groans for us in prayer. There are things that we pray about. I had this week things to pray about that I have no idea what to say to the Lord. That's okay. There's someone who groans for me. And the one who checks my heart, the Father who checks my heart to hear those prayers, the Holy Spirit knows what his will is. And he groans for me with words that can't be uttered in a way that is the will. He prays. You know, I think sometimes I pray and he corrects my language because he knows what the will of the Father is. I think that's what that's playing out there. He helps you by anointing you for ministry. He brings liberty into your life. He cries Abba in our hearts to God. He dispenses God's love into our hearts. He comforts us. These are all straight from the verses, the 50 things there. In spiritual ways that we cannot comprehend, many times we do not recognize the Holy Spirit is daily helping you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Those good works that you have done in your life, that the Lord has allowed in your life to be accomplished, it's because the Holy Spirit did that through you, his power in and through you. You know, folks, I think because of the miraculous things that we see in the early church, as we see around Pentecost and in in that apostolic age, that, that apostolic time, as well as the abuses of certain groups seeking spiritual experiences outside of doctrine, we may mistakenly I'm put a pause there. We may mistakenly primarily look for the work of the Holy Spirit by some supernatural euphoric display that we long to see. And I would say, pause button. Don't you get me wrong. I desire that the Holy Spirit would be seen in miraculous ways. I would love for the Holy Spirit to, to do great healings and that men like like like. Dwight and Melissa, that they would just, they wouldn't have to, do, wouldn't have to do training anymore in Arabic. They just are miraculously filled by the Holy Spirit and empowered to be able to speak and everyone hear it in their own language. I would love for that to happen. I would, I, like every manifestation of the Holy Spirit, I would love that. It would be great. And, comma, but, comma, however, when you look through the scripture at the real verses, about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit that have been presented this morning, that are on your list. Most of these manifestations are in the realm of faith, not sight. There are things that the Holy Spirit is, is, is doing in every one of you, every day. These things are certainly just as real, but they are spiritual manifestations, not physical manifestations, and they are much harder to track and to measure than some big outward 
physical, emotional thing like Pentecost where people are preaching and everyone's hearing it in their own language, okay? But don't you think that the Holy Spirit is working one inch less in you than he worked at Pentecost? I have revealed to you in this, from the scripture this morning great ways that he's working in your life. Great appreciation needs to come from you. Great recognition of that. Great confidence. Let your doubts of being alone yield to the truths that the Holy Spirit is indwelling you. I think one of the best ways to see the Spirit of God working in your life is to ask yourself, would I be drawn to Almighty God the way that I am if I did not have the Holy Spirit? The answer is absolutely not. Or perhaps another way to say that is, why do I pursue the things of God from the heart? Why is my heart crying out? I want you, Abba Father. I love you, Abba Father. I need you, Abba Father. I can't wait till I'm with you, Abba Father. Who is crying? Not your flesh. It is the Holy Spirit of God crying that through you. You would never cry that. You would do whatever your flesh wants to do. Yet there is this longing. There is this yearning in our hearts for all of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior for the true and the living God. And that is happening because of the Holy Spirit. Good toads can hop. Teaching, guiding, changing, helping. We haven't even scratched the surface of pneumatology today, but I want to end by applying what we have preached in three distinct ways to your life of what you're going to do with this sermon. This is not only a scholastic service <laughs> sermon. It is a I submit to the word of God and want to change sermon. Okay? Here's the application. Number one, I commend to you to walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16. It's a command. You've seen it on Sunday nights. Walk in the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 says it this way. Be filled with the Spirit. I think that they're talking about the same things. That is to submit and to surrender to the Holy Spirit on a daily, moment-by-moment basis, looking for Him to lead you, not yourself. Petitioning, asking, praying for Him to guide you as you follow, as he leads you and guides you through the word and through life, giving him full control, walking in the spirit, being filled with the spirit. Number two, application. Ephesians 4.30 says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed to the day of redemption. So the idea is the Holy Spirit's in you and you're his temple, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit and you can grieve him. And that is doing, disobeying him, <laughs> disobeying the commands of scripture, disobeying God. He is, after all, the Holy Spirit in you. Do you get that point? Holy. And he wants you to be holy because he's holy. He wants you to yield your members as instruments of righteousness. And when you don't, and when you allow that to continue in your life, you are grieving the Holy Spirit of God within you. Number three, direct application, quench not the Spirit. That's the command of 1 Thessalonians 5.19. The idea of quench is the the idea of how the Holy Spirit appears a couple times in Scripture as a fire. And it's the idea of stifling His fire in you. We say, what does that mean? Don't throw water on the Holy Spirit. What does it mean, quench? Well, I think it's applied a couple of ways. One, in wholehearted worship. His people need to praise him and glorify him and to be excited about Jesus Christ and to lean in and to, and to, and to chase after God with everything, with every part of passion that we can stir in our life. Don't quench the Spirit. This is what he wants to do in you. I think this also applies in the area of that the Holy Spirit is so often seen leading people to serve Christ. And so often he wants you to do some work for him and he's leading you 
and you know that you can do that, and you know there's an opportunity to serve Christ or to, to, to evangelize and give someone that you know the God, you know there's an opportunity, but you pick up the five-gallon bucket of water and you quench the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Where He wants to be ablaze, allow Him in your life. Where He wants to lead you and use Him, use you, allow Him. Walk in the Spirit, grieve not the Spirit, quench not the Spirit. Would you bow your heads, please?